Hi, Roz. I have here with me today, Roz Smith Ray. And by way of introduction, Roz and I have known each other for 60 years. Um, we went to grade school together and high school in Concord, Massachusetts. And uh, then um, she joined us as a junior at Williams. And I have to say that I, I consider her sort of responsible for my interest in Williams because I didn't know anything about Williams until I went to a football game with her parents and her in something in the late 60s because her brother Sandy was on the football team. And in fact, he was quarterback, right? No, anyway. he was an end. He was an oh, end. He, he caught the okay. passes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Anyway, <laughs> um, I was so smitten by Williams. Uh, it was a gorgeous fall day in the Berkshires. You know, how how could I not have fallen in love with it? So when I found out a few years later that they were accepting women, you know, I jumped right in. So um, I owe a lot of that to Roz. And the cool thing is that we have been in touch over all these years. Um, we're part of actually a group of six of us uh, that get together periodically from our high school days. And uh, so I've, I'm able to keep in touch, even though she lives in Maine now and I'm in Montana, of course. Um, so a number of years ago, I was intrigued when she talked about uh, retiring and getting into making wooden puzzles. And the first never really happened. I guess she sort of retired, but her place of work, which she'll tell you about, they keep they kept reeling her back because she was so instrumental in what they did. And um, anyway, but she and she did take up puzzle making. And so for the last, I think it's been 10 years, uh, I have been the grateful recipient every Christmas of these beautiful handmade puzzles that Roz has made. She makes the same one for myself and these other ladies that we knew from high school, the, the five of us. And she, um, yeah, she is just amazing. Each one becomes more diabolical and clever and makes me swear at her under my breath. I always sit down with a glass of wine on a quiet evening and just know that it's gonna take me more than an hour to do what might be a 65 to 90 piece puzzle. And so um, I have a great regard for her skills, even though she will say that, you know, if she if she did it more, she'd be better. Well, that's true of everything. But I was so fascinated by this world of puzzle making that um, she sort of introduced me to that I thought it'd be really fun to have her, you know, share with us um, her workshop and, you know, and just the world of puzzling. So um but just to start off, Roz, do you just want to kind of give us a quick snapshot of, of what you're, you know, of a little bit about your world? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I, uh, uh, after graduating from Williams, I got very uh, interested in historic house museums and uh, entered that field, uh, worked uh uh, for a while and uh, then took some time off when I had got married and had a couple of boys and um, uh, eventually we uh, my husband and family settled on Mount Desert Island in in Maine most people know that's the the home of uh, Acadia National Park and uh, I took some time off from work uh, while the kids were small and then I got I got longing for something to do and getting back into American decorative arts so I got a job at uh, a historic house in Ellsworth, Maine, which is uh, just about 20 miles from Bar Harbor. And uh, I became the collections manager there. Uh, they had never uh, cataloged their collection. And so that was my first task. Um, and after about 10 years of doing that, uh, I was I was getting a little restless. I wanted to um, enjoy living near Acadia National Park and hiking and, and taking advantage of it. And I've, and I've always had in the back of my mind this curiosity about wooden puzzles. Um, back in the 1990s, I had uh, noticed an article in Down East Magazine about a company in Western Maine called Elms, E-L-M-S, Elms Puzzles. And uh, it was a nice little two or three page article about these people who cut wooden jigsaw puzzles. I thought, wow, that's kind of neat. And I remembered back to my childhood, many people can tell the same story that they would go to their summer, their grandparents' summer house, and there would be uh, some nice old wooden puzzles and they'd do them together and they have these, you know, warm, fuzzy feelings about um, 
uh, you know, about summertime, vacation, grandparents, family together, putting together wooden puzzles. And uh, so I thought, well, you know, that might be something that would be interesting to me. Um, so uh, as I say, after about 10 years of, of working at, at this museum and my kids were were gone and I thought, maybe now's the time to, to uh, investigate uh, puzzle cutting. And uh, I would... Um, I, I would mention it to people and they'd look at me sort of quizzically like, really? Uh, you know, and uh, um, eventually in this group that Nancy just mentioned, this group of uh, five women, I mentioned it on, on a trip that we were taking and uh, one of them said, my husband used to do that. Mm. And I went, really? You know, and she said, he doesn't do it anymore maybe he would sell you his saw. And uh, so it, it took a little bit of time, but uh, eventually I did uh, buy uh, this absolutely wonderful saw um, from uh, her husband and um, got a couple of books, ordered a few books uh, about how to cut puzzles. There was nobody around living near me who cut wooden puzzles. So uh, I never saw anyone demonstrate it. And of course, nowadays you can get online and go to YouTube and there's lots of demonstrations about how to do it. And I, and I, I, I did eventually do some of that. But basically it was just sort of um, getting to know the, getting to know the, um, the materials that you need and experimenting. Mm -hmm. And I must say, I was very naive. I thought, oh, I have all these great ideas about interesting puzzles and I'll call my business out of the box puzzles because I'll be thinking out of the box to, to come up with these neat things like irregular edges and and uh, trick corners. And of course, all of that had already been done, I found out. Um, but in my exploration about how to get started with, with uh, cutting puzzles and looking for information online, I uh, was able to come across this organization called the Puzzle Parlay, and uh, we'll get into that probably a little bit later, but that really broadened my, um, uh, my, my uh, horizons about what wooden jigsaw puzzles are. Mm -hmm. And so back in 2011 is when I started cutting and they were very crude, you know, they were, they, I used to draw out where where the knob and where the in you know the indent would be and try to make columns and rows just like you see in cardboard puzzles mm -hmm. uh, before being able to branch out and do interesting shapes. So mm -hmm. that's how I got started. <laughs> and could you talk about a little bit about the? Excuse me. I'm I've enjoyed listening to what you're saying, and I should go back yeah. to my notes here. Um, what are some of the what are some of the things that are not your normal puzzle that are we'd make we'd make at our grandparents' houses? You know, what have things right. changed? What have changed? What's changed? What's changed about puzzles yes. since then? Yeah. Well, most of the puzzles that you would have done that were cut back in the um, probably in the 30s which was a boom time for puzzle cutting. Um, lots of people took it up. It was a way to make a little bit of money during the depression. Mm -hmm. And when people weren't able to um, have the money to go out uh, and, and travel or you know go to the theater or whatever, um, they had a lot of rental puzzle clubs. So anyway, puzzling, puzzle making and puzzle, um, doing, you know, putting together puzzles um, uh, really took off in the 30s. So most of those puzzles were one of two types. They were either interlocking puzzles, and that's your very standard, um, you know, you've get you've got a you've got a shape here and you've got another shape and they they interlock and they don't they 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 hold together when you pick it up. Mm -hmm. Or what I absolutely loved, which was push fit puzzles. And those are puzzles that don't interlock. Mm -hmm. They're very pesky to do because nothing holds them. You're, you're working on a table, you know, and, and you're putting these pieces together 
and somebody comes along and bumps the table and they kind of jump apart. And it's very That's what I mean about diabolical. The first time you sent me one so of those. Here's, here's just an example of the, the push fit style of puzzle where uh, they can be cut in any kind of wavy shape or straight line shapes or whatever, but um, they're just gonna, gonna push together and fit together. And so I, I really loved that kind of, of puzzle. And for a long time, that was, um, you know, that, that was pretty much what people did. And then, uh, then folks started putting special shapes in. And some of the cutters back in the 30s and 40s had some fa fabulous shapes, but um, they're called whimsies or figurals. Mm -hmm. And those will be shapes like, um, let me show you this against a against a white background. So here's a, a maple leaf mm -hmm. that that um, I like to cut, and that would be a figural because I wouldn't cut other maple leaves in that puzzle. It would have just one maple leaf. Okay. And I might also put in um, a, uh, a a a flying bird. So mm -hmm. that's another figural. There are a lot of people do do human. Uh, humans running or or um, uh, fishing or all sorts of things like that. Um, sometimes you can do a, a figural that is simply a an interesting shape like mm -hmm. this. I don't know if you can see that it, it's just sort of a pinwheel. Almost looks like an octop octopus. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, kind of. There's there's a, the darker side. Um, you can sort of just see. Mm -hmm. And uh, I cut a puzzle with multiple versions of this in it so that you're not sure where that shape belongs. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so so people started doing figurals and they started doing um, uh, sort of uh, more interesting shapes. Um, and now, now with the use of lasers, yeah. um, laser cutters, you can get some really intricate shapes, but uh, a hand uh, scroll saw cutter can't cut as as um, finely as a laser can cut. And we're and they're starting to branch into out into other materials. You used to have just your cardboard puzzles or your wooden puzzles, and now they're getting into acrylic, um, metal mm -hmm. combinations of of materials so that you'll have a puzzle that that's made up of both metal pieces and acrylic pieces or um and and um i don't know whether this is a good time to talk about about uh puzzles that have no end yeah. they're infinity yeah. puzzles this they is move. totally new to me um that and and i was practicing a minute ago so that i could do one of these shifts where this is an irregular edged puzzle. It's actually double sided. In other words, is just as intricate a design using the same colors. So when you first out, you don't know whether your piece is right side up or upside down. Uh -huh. But that plays into the fact that you can take a piece off of this end, flip it over, and it will fit in somewhere else on the puzzle. I don't know whether I'm doing this so that you can see it well enough, but uh, so I took a piece from I took a piece from up here and I fit it in down there. And you can just keep moving pieces, and and this will take different shapes depending upon where that piece piece fits in. So you're never done. I mean, you, you could call this done. All the pieces are put together. Right. But you could say, I want to see if this will turn into something that's more circular or wow. can I string it out or whatever. So, wow. um, so, so that's something that's being done. Um, is that, excuse me, is that, I just wanted to throw the name out. Is that from Nervous Systems makes that? That is from, from a company called Nervous System. No S on the end, Nervous okay. System. And they do, uh, a lot of their design work is just done using computer algorithms. Um, com ah. they just, I don't know how they do it, um, but they just program a, uh, a computer to, 
draw, 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 you know, and then they, they come up with the coloring they like and, and uh, then just set it up on a laser and just let the, let the laser cut, cut away. I think Nancy, you found one uh, when you're doing your research that you found yeah. fascinating. It's called the the you know the Earth puzzle, and they also have the this the Moon puzzle. And um, I can't remember the, the the way they spread it out. Um, well, it's it, like taking a round shape and yes. laying it out flat. Yes, but also they have they in, you know you have these wonderful um, little animal shapes. That like for example, a little kangaroo goes where Australia is, and so they've mixed in all these, and they have um, whale shapes and all these things that animal shapes that that are um, appropriate to whatever continent they're on. It's so clever and really uh, complex. Really. Yeah, they're a fascinating. They're a fascinating company. Um, uh, there's a the uh, <laughs> I would say a young couple. I think they're they're they're. They're uh, middle aged now, probably, but um, getting getting into it, uh, and they were among the first, I think, to use lasers and and computer generated designs. There are other really good laser companies out there um, that uh, that produce incredibly intricate um, patterned pieces. Mm -hmm. The advantage to a laser cut puzzle is that it will be less expensive for you to purchase than a custom cut because with a laser you can cut the same one you just turn the machine on and let it cut do another one cut another one cut another one cut another one it's very fast it's not labor intensive uh the real work is pretty much in the design uh you know that you want it to cut um and uh, uh and and with acrylics, it's pretty much pretty much laser cutting uh, when it comes to doing acrylics and with um, the metal puzzles. But uh, but it allows people to purchase nice wooden puzzles uh, at a reasonable price because uh -huh. I'll uh, I, I've, I've got a couple just boxes here. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, there, there, there's a brand called Artifact Puzzles, and this one here has um, 207 pieces in it, and you can probably buy that for $35 plus mm -hmm. shipping, right? Mm -hmm. A 200-piece hand-cut puzzle would probably cost you somewhere between three and $400 because the pricing nowadays on hand-cut is usually somewhere around a uh, dollar fifty per piece, mm -hmm. and uh, but the advantage of a the the advantage of a um, a hand cut one is that if you make contact with the cutter and you can have your uh, your choice of a picture cut, you mm -hmm. can have your choice of figural pieces put into it, which is really nice for people who are giving them as gifts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and uh, and and you know that 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 puzzle has been created for you with uh, a lot of thought and uh, and, and you know uh, emotion, a lot of a lot of kindness, you know, right. a, um, a lot of feeling behind the cutting of a uh, of a of a hand cut wooden puzzle. So, mm -hmm. um, why don't you? Why don't you tell us a little bit about um, Puzzle Parlay, and then I want to go into, you know, tips that you have on how how you approach a, doing yeah. a puzzle. Sure, sure. Well, I mentioned earlier that um, that one of the avenues that helped me uh, get better as a puzzle cutter was to have discovered a group called the Puzzle Parlay. Um, it's a group of people who back in 1994, um, this, this woman who took up puzzle cutting in her 70s uh, and was communicating with a few other puzzle cutters at that time, got, got together with some of them and said, you know, we should be sharing our information. We should be sharing what we do. We should be sharing our techniques and our discoveries. And so 
Uh, this group uh, started out about a dozen people. Uh, they met together a couple of years where, ago. And then where did they meet? Where was their they met, they met in Concord, Massachusetts, where Nancy and I are both from. Um, I did not know anything about them back uh, back when they were first meeting in the 1990s. Um, but uh, since then, the group has grown. Um, and we have a we have a puzzle parlay. I'm I'm now very much a part of it. Um, I'm on the steering committee of. And every two years, we plan uh, a in person gathering. Um, uh, just this last July, we were in Sturbridge, Massachusetts, and we had 130 people at it. And uh, it's we we attract people who are puzzle enthusiasts, who are puzzle uh, historians collectors um, and crafters. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, it's a nice mix of people. And fortunately, thanks to Facebook and the internet and um, all the social media, uh, we're now attracting a really nice group of young people. And um, we, had a, we had probably 50 people who had never come to a puzzle parley before um, at this last one. Can you just say a word about how COVID, because when you were talking about the 30s, what people did in the 30s that, you know, and you were, you and I were talking earlier about how COVID really shifted the, the. Oh, co COVID, COVID just, life. COVID just turned the puzzle world upside down for a little while um, because people are stuck at home. And they say, oh, you know, want something to do. They're tired of reading books. I said, oh, puzzles. You know, and puzzle suddenly companies were cleaned out of their inventory. I mean, they just they and then they couldn't keep up. And if they were someone other than someone like like I who just cuts by myself, but if you're part of a uh, of of a company where you come together and you're cutting, or it's a laser company and there's multiple employees, they were shut down for a while, so they couldn't produce more puzzles. Um, so puzzle. So during the during uh, the first year of COVID, all, all you know puzzles were just flying out the door. Uh, you know the, people couldn't keep up, and um, uh, gradually that began to subside. And and now, well, a whole lot of people discovered puzzles and discovered more about them and started to be more discerning in the the kind of uh, puzzles that they wanted to do. They were no longer just doing cardboard puzzles. They were looking for these wooden ones. Um, and uh, so it, it really did change the puzzle world. And I think that's partly why there's some young people involved in it now. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that's happened is um, speed puzzling has, yeah, I wanted has you to talk about taken that. off yeah. and that's something that can be done online i'm not quite sure how they do it but they, they 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 work this online but it's also something that now people are getting back to which is getting together in in large groups and and uh uh competing to see who can put together this the same puzzle um uh the fastest so Anyway, they, so COVID really did affect um, affect the puzzle world, and it affected the puzzle parlay. We were supposed to have one in 2020, and we canceled it, and uh, people were disappointed. We decided to do a virtual one in 2021. So we had all of our usual guest speakers. We had sharing, show and tell. We had sharing, um, all done virtually, and people were very, very thankful for that, and it allowed the international crowd to be part of it. We had someone zooming in from Australia. We had people zooming in from Europe um, uh, and from the West Coast, people who otherwise wouldn't travel in person to, to the parlay. So yeah, it, it, it made a big difference. It expanded uh, people's knowledge of, of uh, puzzles. And, um, you know, we will, this, this past, 2022, we did not do a um, online component to the puzzle parley, but I am guessing that in the future, we will do a hybrid situation where we can uh, provide the programming, at, you know, in real time um, 
to people who, who can't come there in person. Yeah. One thing we do do is post all of our sessions to YouTube. The Puzzle yeah. Parley has its own YouTube channel. And uh, we haven't gotten 2022 up online yet, but you can see 2021. And, um, and, and things that were recorded from earlier parlays are online. So Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, puzzleparlay.org is, um, there's a wealth of information there. It's really cool. Well, in our last couple of minutes, why don't you sort of give us an idea of, of um, you know, how you approach, how you would recommend approaching ch these challenging kind of puzzles that where you don't have a picture to go on. We were talking about that. None of the ones um, you send for Christmas ever come with a picture. So you have to sort of figure it out from, from uh, trial and error. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, it's fun to cut them, knowing that people are not going to have the picture. Um, it, it's, it's fun to try to, to figure out a way to make it harder for someone to know what's going to happen. Yeah. Like, um, Nan Nancy will recognize this mm -hmm. picture. This is a, this is a Christmas card. It's one of the ones that I cut for the, for the group. And this was the first time I had done a push fit, uh, puzzle for the group. So they didn't know uh, what the picture was, and they also were faced with a new, a new um, uh, cutting style. Um, so with 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 something like this, you know, you look for places that'll line up. You know, this did have a white border, so you're able to start perhaps with trying to put together your border, and then you you know, uh, I often when I'm putting together a puzzle that that I've rented or or purchased and I don't have the picture, um, I put all the pieces out and I grab one random piece and I start working from that piece and I try to I try to build it out from there. Mm -hmm. That works if you have up to say three or four hundred pieces. When you get, if it's more than that, it's really hard to do a puzzle that way. Um, but I do it just to challenge myself and to be, to be, um, uh, to prolong the joy of doing the puzzle. Uh, but most, most people either have a color bias or a shape bias. In other words, they'll, they're drawn to the colors. And so they want to find where, where colors match up. Mm -hmm. um, other people are taken by the shape and they will look for where the shape um, plays into the, into the, to the assembly of the, of the puzzle. Um, and of course, you're really doing both, but one may be a little more dominant first. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a, here's a shape. I think this is, this is, it has blue and green on it. I'll look for another blue and green shape, you know, but um, so uh, the, the thing when you don't know whether you have an irregular edge or a straight edge, um, look for how many straight sides, straight sided pieces there are. Mm -hmm. and if they're not a lot, then you're probably going to have an irregular edge. So show that, show that. Uh, yeah. So, so, yeah. so this is, this is a, a puzzle I'm doing for a friend. Who, who made these who, who made these fish that are in the in the uh, picture she took a photograph of it and sent me the photograph just to say hey look at the pretty fish I made and I said oh that'll make a great puzzle I'm gonna I'm gonna surprise her with this but instead of making it a rectangle or a square I decided I'm gonna cut the corners and so you have straight edges but you know you're you're not going to be able to Pretty soon, when you try putting together just building the edge first, you're going to say, hmm, I don't have four corners, you know, so. Um, Can so you that, show that, the that, one you made us for Christmas that uh, of the books? The oh, book yeah, 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 it. it's here somewhere. Jeepers, it was here a minute ago. Uh, yeah, here we go. Here we go. So, so this this was one that I that I cut for the group. That um, this was actually a a trick, a very tricky one because it not only had the irregular edge, but this is the one where I cut out a Christmas tree yeah. in the middle, 
yeah. and threw that away. So when they put it together, yeah. the, there was a void. There, was, there, there were no pieces in the middle that made that Christmas tree. So you're putting it together, you're saying, why, why can't I find that piece? Why can't I find that piece that connects? Well, it, it wasn't given to you. It, that's called a dropout, is that right? It's, it's called, called a dropout drop or a yeah. void. Yep. yep, yep. So so that's another tricky thing you can do. Um, color line cutting is another one where, say, going back, back to this one, if I cut right on the color line mm -hmm. so you color is not yes uh yes. part of your 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 clue as to where 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 this one will fit against this one um so color line cutting is a is a old but really good trick um it, it's fun when you have something that that has definite color uh lines to it so, Roz, we only we're we're kind of running short yeah. on time here. Show us that one, and then I want to find out from you what what are the things that you're kind of looking forward to challenging yourself with in the puzzling world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I just want to show one other variation in puzzles nowadays, right. and this is a is basically a three D puzzle. It's got multiple layers, one, two, three, four layers, and so these top puzzle pieces are on top of three more layers of, of splashy, it's called the river, you know, um, and so you, you dump this out and then you, you're not putting a flat puzzle together, you're, you're building layers. So uh, that, that's, that's a great one. It's by a guy named Chris Yates who lives out in Montana. Oh, wow. He lives in Montana. Cool. Uh, moved out there a couple of years ago. Um, so what do I, what do I want to do? I really look forward to the day when I can have more time in my puzzle room and try doing some of the things that I see when I go to the puzzle parlay or that I see when I buy a puzzle from some other hand cutter and they have a really neat style yeah. or they have a really neat um, trick. Mm -hmm. um, I have never done a double-sided puzzle mm -hmm. where you have a picture on both sides. Yeah. And uh, I have never done a puzzle where um, there's more than one solution to it. And I don't mean the infinity one that just keeps going on and on, but people have done a typical thing is like a snake or a serpent. And I don't know why that works particularly well, but um, there can be more than one solution to it you can have this the you know often the, the serpent will or the or dragon or something will curl around but you can also put it together so that its tail goes in a different direction and um you know the, so there's there's some challenges some things that other people have done that i've never figured out how to do so i i look forward to doing that um i'm not gonna get into into probably multi-layer puzzles. Um, at this point, I'd be happy if I could just do some really nice um, plain puzzles. <laughs> well, I am looking forward in a couple of months to getting another puzzle from you in the mail and setting aside probably more than an hour and a half to finish it. Um, thank you so much for sharing, you know, your thoughts, ideas, and experience with all of us, Roz. And um, I look forward to hearing more about your puzzling in the future. Yeah, well, I hope it. I hope that uh, those who view this will uh, jump on to the to, to the internet and look for some fun puzzles. Uh, now that now that everybody's inventory is getting built up again, uh, it's a good time to uh, to get into it to uh, realize that there's more to it than a lot of folks realize, and uh, you know get. Get, get into it. And um, maybe some of you will take up puzzle cutting as well. Thank you, Roz. Take care. Thanks, Bye -bye. Nancy. Good to see you. Bye-bye.